Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you everybody for coming. Um, this is Internet Policy Wars 3.0 is the past a prologue to the fight for Web3 question mark. Um, thank you all for coming. This event is hosted by the Congressional Internet Caucus Academy and we've been doing these briefings since 1996 um, with in conjunction with the Congressional Internet Caucus itself, um, which is a group of members of on Capitol Hill in the House and Senate. Um, the co-chairs of the Congressional Internet Caucus on the House side are Congresswoman Anna Eshoo and Congressman Michael McCall. And on the Senate side, it's uh, Senator uh, Patrick Leahy and Senator John Thune. And we're, we're thrilled that they, they are willing to you know, co-host these events with us. Um, this a uh, few thanks I need to, to send out. Um, we want to thank the Filecoin Foundation for the decentralized web, which is um, in part responsible for this event, and also the Internet Society, who's doing a, a global simulcast of this event to the, to their audience. So we're, thank you to to both of them. Um, before we get going, a little bit of housekeeping. Our Twitter account, where we might be putting out some information about this event, is at is at NetCaucusAC, and um, the hashtag for today is hashtag governance three. So um, before I introduce our moderator, um, I just wanna say this, we're really excited about this, this event. Um, it spans the entire arc um, of our history um, for the Congressional Internet Caucus and the Congressional Internet Caucus Academy from the mid 1990s all the way through uh, to today. I think we're at the precipice of a new iteration of the internet and we're talking about policymaker awareness. And this is super important to us. And this has been our mission for the past 25 years. So with, with that, I'm going to hand it off to our expert, who is um, our moderator today, is Danny O'Brien. Um, some, some of you may know Danny from his work at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, Danny was with the foundation for many, many years. And um, now he is a senior fellow with the Filecoin Foundation and the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. So let me just hand it over to Danny. And Danny, take it from here. Hey everyone, thank you very much for uh, coming. Uh, as we, uh, as the title describes, we, we have a little sort of conceit that we're playing with, which is that uh, the moment that we see right now where um, the first sort of rumblings of an understanding that something is happening um, in the uh, Web3 uh, blockchain cryptocurrency space right now. And I, I think there's a genuine interest in Washington to, uh, both understand that and create the environment that's good for its users and good for innovation and uh, good for society in general. But it's a little challenging to work out what that was. And um, as Tim said, I think for some of us, um, you know, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, um, but it does rhyme. Somebody said in the past, and I presume by extension, someone will say that again in the future. Um, and there have been some echoes of that moment in the 90s when uh, lawmakers, policymakers, and almost everybody else in the world realized that there was a, a new entrant in the field of not just communication, but almost every part of our world. And the decisions that were made there, I think for those of us who, who, who were uh, um, involved in that to some degree, and I'm very happy to say that many of our panelists were, were there at the beginning. Um, uh, it, it didn't feel like there was a coherent approach here. It was a lot of learning to do. Um, there was a lot of mistakes made um, and there were a lot of short-term thinking, trying to work out what, what needed to be done next. But the truth is, is that entire period set the scene for what we see now and also set the scene for what will happen in the next 30 years. Um, from the Section 230 to the throwing out of the rest of the Communications Decency Act um, by the courts, uh, to the fight over whether cryptography, strong cryptography should be a prohibited export. And of course, that underlies not only what security we have on the current internet, but the very foundations of what we're also going to be talking about Web3 and the crypto world. Um, all of those were established in those last 10 years and uh, in that, that mad scrabble. Um, to give us a little bit of insight on, on uh, that mad scrabble and how it might connect to the current Mad Scrabble is uh, I'm very delighted to introduce Kevin Werbeck. Um, Kevin is the author of The Blockchain and the New Architecture of Trust, um, uh, and of course now professor at the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. Um, 
But back then, uh, he really did have not only a window seat on the, the digital revolution, um, but uh, a huge influence on how, in particular, the FCC, where he was, uh, he was uh, um, the, the person sort of leading the policy technology development in that area. Uh, and also, Kevin, you, you, you were editor for many years of Esther Dyson's release 1.0, which I think if not invented, certainly popularized this idea of having a single decimal point after an integer, which is what we're dealing with with Web 3.0. So, Kevin, what was what was it? What kind of things were you seeing in uh, in Washington as a response? And like, what do you think was they got right, and what do you think they got wrong? Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks uh, to uh, Danette Coggins for having me on this. Uh, so it's interesting. At some level early on, there was a tremendous amount of excitement about the internet. Um, only it really wasn't the internet we were talking about in the early 90s. Uh, it was uh, what Al Gore and others called the information superhighway, or, or later it was called the national information infrastructure. Really, you know, we were talking about applications that you know someday you will do your banking online and you will get your healthcare online, you go to school online, all kinds of crazy fantasies like that. But generally, it was discussed in the context of proprietary online services. AOL was the dominant service back then, or new kinds of government-based systems that would be built. Um, and the internet sort of came about and really uh, came to the fore during that time period. Um, and you know, what's interesting was, on the one hand, there was a recognition that uh, it was important for policymakers and regulators to consider the effects on innovation and to, and to avoid doing things that would uh, prevent the internet from reaching its potential. Uh, so uh, when I moved into the position at the FCC, being in charge of internet policy, my boss said, well, you can make up your title. And I said, oh, that's great. And he said, well, there's only one word you cannot use in your title. I said, oh, what's that? He said, internet. And well, why is that? I'm doing internet policy. He said, well, if people in Silicon Valley and the internet companies and the technologists hear that there's a guy at the FCC, the federal communications regulator, the federal censor, uh, as it were, of content and media um, that does internet policy, they're going to think that means the FCC is coming for you. Uh, and we're not. Um, so, so my title was Council for New Technology Policy instead. Um, but there was that recognition that uh, many of the traditional structures that we had weren't quite a good fit. Yet at the same time, uh, when you look at what started to happen as the internet started to develop, um, really some of the earliest things were initiatives to try and limit it or restrain it or take action. Um, so, of course, in 1996, uh, when Congress passed the Communications Act rewrite, it included virtually nothing whatsoever about the Internet. It's important for people to understand. This was 1996, so it wasn't that early. Uh, but this massive law essentially ignores the Internet, except for the part which said uh, indecent content on the Internet is illegal. Um, that's what the CDA was. Now, now, people now tend to forget about that because that part of the law was overturned, nine nothing by the Supreme Court as an infringement on the First Amendment. The piece that remains is Section 230, which was the countervailing piece that was put in by initially Senators Cox and, and, and Wyden um, to provide this uh, safe harbor for online service providers in light of those restrictions. Um, the restrictions were overturned, but, but it's important to understand that, that Congress was thinking, what do we need to do seeing this new technology? Um, some of them immediately said, well, we've got to deal with bad stuff, with pornography and indecency. Similarly, we had examples um, of incumbent companies. We saw this a lot at the FCC. Communications is regulated. Um, and we had, first of all, the phone companies coming to us and saying, the internet's killing our networks. This was, remember, dial-up internet before broadband. They said, our networks are getting total, totally overloaded. We need to charge per minute rates to internet service providers. This would have killed the internet if you had to pay uh, every minute that you were online the same kinds of rates you had to pay at that point for long distance services. So uh, we had to at the FCC put this out for public comment. And so I came up with the uh, really stupid idea that we should create an email box where you could send an informal comment to the FCC. This was at the point where the only way you could file a comment with the FCC was on paper. But I said, well, let's let's you know, there's this email thing. Let's just let people email us their comments informally. Um, and Steve Case, the CEO of AOL, decided uh, that his 
uh, monthly chat with AOL users. Remember, AOL was the dominant provider of millions of users. Um, he said, well, the FCC wants your views, AOL users, on whether there should be this tax, these permanent charges on internet access. Um, I get this call from the uh, CIO of the FCC saying uh, the Federal Communications mail server has crashed because hundreds of thousands of comments are coming in. What did you do? <laughs> I said, well, we let people say what they think. Um, that had an impact. Um, although, you know, that even though that uh, proposal um, or, or request for comment didn't go anywhere at the FCC, thankfully, um, later on in Congress, uh, Senator Ted Stevens and um, a faction of mostly rural state senators came back to the FCC and said, you have to impose these access charges because we need it to fund universal service programs. Um, and the FCC actually had to do a lot of work to very carefully respond uh, to say, well, well, no, we care, of course, about universal service and funding it, uh, but the way to get there is not to put these massive additional charges on internet services. Um, so there were these series of actions. There also was a proposal I got at the FCC from the Long Distance Resellers Association that specifically asked us to ban internet telephony, voice over IP. They said this, this should be stopped because it's unregulated voice over the internet. A and again, um, we uh, found a way to not do something really stupid. Um, so it's it's important not to think that you know, this meant that um, there was this massive industry that was trying to kill the internet in every respect, but the, there was a lot of lack of understanding. Um, and at that point, the internet community was really small. Um, there, there were only a few tens of millions of people in the entire world on the internet. And when we talked about the internet industry, it was uh, you know Netscape, a browser vendor. There were, there were a handful of companies that were around. Um, but fortunately, I think there was a recognition of the potential. There were many thoughtful people in government um, who, who saw that. Ultimately, we came together um, in uh, creating in 1997 what was called the Framework for Global Electronic Commerce through the Clinton White House, which really put a stake in the ground, uh, not just in the US, but globally, it had a huge impact on other countries where the US uh, government, the federal government said, no, we think the private sector should lead. There are regulatory issues that need to be addressed. Uh, but we should do them in the context of the potential for innovation. So I, I think largely we got it right, uh, but uh, it was not always obvious going through that that's the direction we were going to go. That's fascinating. I mean, uh, so I think one of the things that you can draw from this is that that often in the very earliest days, the laws that have the most effect on on a new technology are ones that aren't necessarily aimed or even thinking about it. It's because they have to grow and thrive within the, the pre-existing regulatory structure. So Andrew, I realize that each of these introductions is gonna consist of going, you are this now, but in a former life, you were something completely different. Um, Andrew, right now, you're, you're the president of an amazing startup, which is actually looking to reform um, uh, the very nature of architecture, particularly for uh, high density living in, in, in New York. But um, before that, you were, of course, the, uh, the deputy US chief technology officer at the White House. Uh, you spent some time at, at Google. But like as we, we, we go back in the time machine, um, what you the at this point you were you were really at the head of of, of where regulation and the internet uh, uh, met, which was at ICANN, the organization that sort of maintains and still maintains the domain name system. So when you go to a web address and type in a name, um, where that name goes and who originally got that name to point it that way is all determined by this sort of quasi government but global now uh, organization. Can you can you walk us through a little bit about what you saw with this these winds of proposals buffeting you as you kind of tried to steer this ship through uh, through those early days? Yeah, totally. Well, I mean, I'll just say, like as you can see from my background, we were um, engaged in some very advanced uh, cinder block and uh, rusting uh, hardware uh, architecture. It's kind of a throwback to a, a kind of a uh, um, uh, an older time. Um, I'm actually in, a, in, a, in an industrial park in New Jersey because we're at this facility, we're prototyping like our very cool architectural approach. And so um, hence my uh, sexy background. So, um, so yeah, so, so, so I, I got my start. I mean, I should just say, Kevin and I were law school classmates and we both got chucked out into the world of kind of like Washington law uh, early on. And our timing was extraordinary. So like, I'm deeply jealous of Clev and Carlos and 
your counterparts who are, you know, where we were um, some time ago as a, as a kind of like rising set of technologies kind of hit the world and, and hit the, the world of, uh, of policy and regulation. The, the, the way that I got into this was that I was like the junior most and easily most useless lawyer on the team that challenged the Communications Decency Act. So this was at the firm of Jenner and Block, um, and I was just a new associate there, and I wormed my way onto this case. And part of how I talked my way on was because I had been very, I had been like sufficiently poor in college that I had to become an internet person in what was then BitNet days in order to learn to use email to keep in touch with high school friends. That's kind of like my origin story. And when I was at the law firm and this case came down as a First Amendment case, I went into the partner's office and I was like, I know how this stuff works, you know, like with my crossed fingers behind my back, you know, and uh, uh, that case, as Kevin said, went up to the Supreme Court. It was a super experience for a, a very junior lawyer. And anyway, that kind of like randomly, uh, you know, uh, that sort of random event allowed me to um, uh go back to Harvard Law School as a fellow in internet law um, right at the beginning of the Berkman Center there. And, and that led to my befriending John Postel, who was the kind of engineer uh, uh, figure of like Buddha-like wisdom and respect across the community, who had been doing the DNS and IP address allocation literally himself with a couple of grad students for you know 15 years by that point. And uh, uh, as, as Kevin pointed out, the Clinton administration was trying to formalize its approach to the internet. And one of the things that they decided quite rightly was that this one person shop in Los Angeles probably needed to turn into um, a proper entity. Um, and anyway, very tragically, John Postel had a heart attack and died right when this process was getting going. And because I happened to be around and I had some free time, I sort of dove in and I became arguably, depending on if you, what, if you count paycheck numbers, the first employee of ICANN um, and uh, uh, its chief policy officer. So what that was, was an effort to um, create an entity which was government adjacent, but not governmental, global, but accountable um, and multi-stakeholder in its approach to make policies for this very specific set of resources that weren't really scarce, but they had to have uniqueness as one of their attributes. And so global coordination was like sort of seen to be essential. Um, anyway, uh, I thought I would just mention kind of like three themes that came around from those early, early battles. Uh, one of which is, uh, is the theme of moral panics. So a thing that is happening right now with distributed technologies, blockchain-based technologies and others, is that you see people overestimating uh, the threats, the novelty and the jeopardy that's created by the new technology. Um, because it seems to heighten and accentuate uh, the ca capacity for harm. And so we see that happening right now. Uh, the fears about terrorist financing, uh, uh, child sexual, sex abuse imagery uh, transactions, uh, arms deals, money laundering. Um, I'm, not, I'm not at all saying that those things are not present. They're present in all the financial systems of the world. But the moral panic fear is that these new technologies are going to be somehow a step change, step function change in the um, ability of those uh, uh, malevolent uses to take place and be executed um, and maybe to be executed without detection or any possibility of law enforcement. So that's one thing that we saw with Senator Exxon's you know, blue book back in the internet days. The internet is for porn and that's it. Um, and uh, we see a similar kind of like moral panic happening right now. And I hope one of the things we can talk about today is actually like a more proper contextualization of what these technologies are good for. Um, and then a second one is uh, uh, incumbent arbitrage. So one thing that, that absolutely happens when a new te te technology comes along is that incumbent industries suddenly fear like their basic business models are gonna be uncompetitive. They're gonna get you know, disintermediated to use uh, uh, the kind of language of internet law. And what that means is they will either use existing regulations and try to get government to interpret them, uh, for example, uh, uh, incumbent telecom companies trying to get the uh, FCC or Congress to treat voice over IP as an illegal, unregulated service that must be wedged into the existing voice regulations. Because in the existing world of voice regulations, through some combination of regulatory capture, expertise, and maybe just substantive regulation, they can eke out uh, uh, the persistence of their business model in the face of a disruptive technology. Um, 
So uh, we saw the same thing with the recording industry and the motion picture industry, trying to figure out how to maintain you know, uh, 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 existing networks of distribution of content in the face of uh, networks that could blow them open and create all kinds of alternatives, some legal, some illegal for sure, but uh, the, the incumbents moved. And I think what I would say right now is that we're probably gonna see financial institutions uh, you know, try to figure out how to avoid becoming disintermediated through some combination of embracing the new technologies, leveraging uh, regulatory and policy processes uh, uh, where possible um, or where necessary in their view. And that's just something to be conscious of. Incumbents will try to use the policy process to substantiate or to, to kind of harden their uh, economic positions. And then the third one is what uh, uh, I think I can properly credit to uh, Professor Jamie Boyle from uh, Duke, the libertarian gotcha. So the libertarian gotcha was a theme that came out in the, in the 90s. Um, uh, it has some real utility, which is to say, ah, with a new technology, uh, if you regulate it, you will destroy it. The new technology is good and powerful, but if you regulate, you will destroy what you like about it. And I think the, the, the thing that to be on the lookout for there is claims of absolute immunity from regulation, uh, because I think if there's one thing that we've seen over the last two decades, the public has very much evolved, governments have evolved, regulators have evolved to understand that new technologies do not serve the public interest when they are completely devoid of any form of consumer protection um, or uh, 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 mechanism for vindicating the public interest broadly construed. Um, and so those are three things, moral panics, incumbent self-protection, uh, and the libertarian gotcha to be on the lookout for. As Kevin said, I will just stress my own agreement that um, we actually got most things right um, back in the 90s. Um, I think uh, 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 with some of the application layer services and their ability to monopolize you know, ad revenues, uh, you know, social networking features or whatever, there's a whole bunch of things that we have not gotten right, and I, I hope to see us still get right. But broadly speaking, in the early days of the internet, a light-handed approach, uh, a, uh, a, an avoidance of overreaction in the face of moral panics or in some incumbent self-protection, and some efforts towards consumer protection and so forth, I think was the right mix. Um, and maybe that's, if there's one uh, set of lessons from the 90s, it's that that's a not, not a bad starting point for a new, powerful, global, distributed technology like blockchains and so forth. That's great. I mean, one of the observations I sort of draw from that, uh, particularly this, this thing of uh, incumbents uh, trying to uh, uh, protect themselves is, of course, like we're talking about Web 1.0 uh, um, 100 or so years ago. But there's also now I think the incumbents in this space are often um, Web 2.0, right? Facebook, um, Google, these large giants. And Tim and I were talking before the, the, um, the event and we were we were both sort of considering like how widely do we want to view this at, at uh, the Falcon Foundation for the Decentralized Web where we're not we don't just think about the blockchain and, and the finance area we also think about these opportunities to create things that can re-decentralize the internet and take things away but this is a moment where I think regulators are really looking hard about how best to rein back uh, these big incumbents and I think there's a risk that the, the incumbents will do this kind of Aikido where they'll, they'll, they'll take those rules and you'll, 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 you'll have them as part of the conversation and they'll try and direct it at these, these new services. Okay, I now turn to Clev. Clev, um, I, 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 I have a million notes here and I don't even know how to describe, but all I would do is urge everybody to uh, read, read Clev's book, um, uh, Clever Revolution. Um, she's, a, she's a fellow Gen Xer like myself. And uh, I think what, what, what's interesting in this context, many interesting things, not least the playlist. I love a book with a playlist, um, <laughs> is that you have a foot in both camps of both regulation and this new world. Um, and it's a little bit more in this Web 2.0 space. You were in the Obama um, uh, uh, White House. You were communications director for, for, um, for Barbara Lee. Um, and now uh, you, you're the head of the National Policy Network of Women of Color in blockchain. So you moved from the Washington circus to the crypto circus at this very at this very key moment. So, 
And, and also, I, I'm reading the book, you see that as a kind of, I'm putting words in your mouth, but kind of as a, um, as a liberatory process. Like you came to blockchain not to, you know, make your, your bazillions, but because you saw this as an empowering technology um, for, for those who haven't been best served by um, the existing systems, including Web 2.0. So I don't have a question here. I just want you to like, kind of like maybe fill in what that, that meant and what you've seen in both DC and in, uh, in the crypto space. Yes, thank you, Danny. I'm thrilled to be here. Before I begin, I do want to thank our host, the Congressional Internet Caucus Academy, and one of the event sponsors, the Filecoin Foundation for the Decentralized Web. They promote the development of open source software and open protocols for decentralized data storage and retrieval and retrieval networks. And they are actually part of the Blockchain Association, and I'm an advisor to the Blockchain Association. So this is a great, great topic, right? Because as you mentioned, we're in Web 2.0 and where are we going, right? So today the internet is actually in the very early stages of an architectural shift back to more decentralized and open applications that many call Web 3. Now Web 3 is not a new concept. Jeffrey Zeldman, one of the early developers of Web 1.0 and 2.0 applications expressed the need for Web 3 back in 2006. Let's face it, there's broad consensus that the internet is broken. At the heart of the concerns is the monetization of the public's data by a handful of centralized owners of today's internet. And there's broad outrage about privacy breaches, surveillance, misinformation, attacks on diversity. So what is Web3? Well, it is fueled by a fusion of technologies, artificial intelligence, machine learning, decentralized finance, peer-to-peer -peer blockchain applications like smart contracts, which are all paving the way for Web3. The vision is a new type of internet with digital infrastructure to solve the deep rooted problems currently plaguing Web3. Web3 leverages new technologies to, faci to facilitate more secure, personalized data sharing, ensuring that the internet is interconnected, interoperable, seamless in a decentralized manner. Filecoin Foundation is a leader in this space. We actually can restore trust, expand access, enable microtransactions, and enhance peer-to-peer -peer data file storage. The stakes are high. According to a recent report by the Pure Research Center, around seven in 10 Americans use social media to connect with one another engage with news content, share information, and entertain themselves. And to bring it back to our conversation today, as we've shared in the 1990s, Washington debated the merits and potential of the internet. Today, blockchain and cryptocurrency face similar federal scrutiny, but there is a difference. Issues around inclusion and education were minimal 25 years ago. But today, at the heart of the regulatory and policy debate around blockchain and cryptocurrency, those are those issues, right? People wanna talk about bias in design. People are concerned about the digital divide. Accessibility is something we should be talking about. And certainly the learning curve for non-technical users must be front and center as Web3 evolves. Blockchain's promise of increased financial inclusion and infrastructural freedom and innovation beyond digital currencies is real. And with Web3, it's well, Web3 is one of the spaces where we can definitely leverage decentralized technologies as well as machine learning artificial intelligence and not just solve the problems of Web2, but also create a better experience 
for users in the innovation economy. Thank you, Claire. That was that was great. I mean, I I, I didn't want to blow our trumpet too much, but I, so just so people know, the uh, the Falcon Foundation, Falcon is is one of these uh, 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 crypto systems, but we're actually concerned with storage. So I think it's one of those areas where, and I, I think this is something that we'll we'll touch on with 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 Carlos is. Um, uh, there's more to this than finance, but I think finance lies at the heart of it. And maybe we can talk about this widely, more widely. Um, and I know that one of the things we that I've seen that gave me a window into the possibilities here and how it maps to Web 1.0 is Carlos is, is the Brave browser. So Brave um, is a, uh, a, 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 a new browser. Um, it was founded by uh, the, um, the creator of JavaScript. So that goes back to Netscape um, and that early wash of, of uh, novelty in the 90s. Um, but it's a browser that has a lot of these Web 3.0 features kind of seamlessly put in. So you, can, you don't have to depend on uh, websites. You can switch to sites that are stored in a more decentralized, more resilient way um, using IPFS. Um, and also it has um, domains that aren't controlled by ICANN. So this is like an alternative, um, a wider sort of competitive space for even um, uh, choosing where you can you can go on this certainly wider internet. So, but Carlos, I actually wanted to talk to you um, um, not just about what Brave is doing, but actually again, your your sort of path is is really interesting. Just to give one of the things I think illuminated people in Web 1.0 is watching people flock to uh, this new industry and kind of define it and what their thoughts about how um, the future should be was really defined by um, those, those young people kind of walking into this and defining it just as, as Kevin and Andrew and, and, and Claire have kind of um, defined that um, uh, uh, in their past. So Carlos, tell me a little bit about um, about your passage and like what you, as someone who's heavily involved in this on a day-to-day -day basis, see as being the promise of, of this area and what it will grow into? Well, the from, from my own journey, yes, it, it began, I was as a high school teacher. Um, and really when I started learning about, I mean, to go for the blockchain and cryptocurrency aspect, this idea of disintermediating from institutions, peer-to-peer -peer direct, I do know that I used to drive four miles from the highway exit in the Bronx, right near Fordham to my high school, and I did not see one bank branch. And when I started going down the rabbit hole in this whole blockchain crypto sphere, um, you heard a lot about banking the unbanked. Uh, and that, that's a siren call. It's a big platitude people talk about, but they would talk about far flung places. And so I realized just sitting there at my desk when I was waiting for my students to come in, looking out the window that I was sitting in the shadow of the financial capital of the world with the largest population of unbanked people in the city, if not the country. Uh, where I was teaching was Morrisania, which is the poorest congressional district in the United States. Um, and so things just started connecting. Um, but if I can talk about with, with Brave, one thing that I think is interesting to, to really illuminate for, for us is that you know Brave rests on two pillars, right? The first of which is privacy, and the second of which is consent. And the privacy piece is very, is very interesting in the fact that, you know, as you said, our founder created JavaScript, but then created it and not maybe under, not seeing where it would be taken by other people and how, you know, really web 2.0 is based on the, the, ex, the exploitation of, da, of people's data um, and exploitation in general. And really uh, what web, web three, or, you know, in terms of, from my view, blockchain creates is the idea that we can have the ability to have ownership in our own data, in our own value, in our own capital. And it presents an opportunity for those that are maybe, you know, with the correct education become sophisticated enough and, and savvy enough to take advantage of it and leverage it. Um, and when I, I taught a couple of boot camps on cryptocurrency and blockchain in the South Bronx before I was hired in Brave, um, and it really came out of this idea that teaching these, these, these students how to leverage 
to new technology, not only for the personal benefit in terms of value, but also for a new industry. Um, you know, there's a large crypto industry in New York City, and my idea was to create a funnel of talent that can go directly from, let's say, communities in the South Bronx uh, to these to these uh, to these companies to work. Um, but what Brave does that I think is, is kind of really fits in here is that, you know, if you choose to opt into Brave Rewards, for example, you earn our utility token, which is the basic attention token. And when I was a teacher, we talked a lot about equity and access. And so really, there is one universal thing that we all have, which Web, Web 2.0 really was able to uh, leverage is our attention. And so no matter who you are, you have eyes, you have attention. Brave found a way using blockchain to commodify that attention and also return it back to the user. Now that user can now use that to, to really reward their favorite content creators and publishers. Uh, Wikipedia is my favorite example. You know, if you've used Wikipedia in the last five years, you know, that big pop-up comes up that from Jimmy Wells asking for $3. You can use Brave to contribute to that. And so that's one example that I see in terms of the promise of what of what this technology can give, because no matter who you are, what your background is, what language you speak, if you're going to utilize these tools, you can obtain value. And so, you know, and then you're able to use that value how you see fit. And so you're able to really gain what the whole peer to peer promise is right. The intermediaries have taken all the value. And here you have an op opportunity to take that value yourself um, and then use it to pay for things like a VPN or our, you know, a, a premium video chat product. And there's many things in the pipeline, but my point is that the real power here is the idea of like, taking an opportunity for the first time to empower those communities that have not been able to leverage and take advantage of the status quo. And so this is, a, I like to think this is a new frontier. I mean, I, I, I joke with a friend of mine who's a history professor um, in St. John's and say, you know, this is kind of discovering the new world. This is, this is the year, you know, the Europeans coming to the new world. And, and there, regardless of whether, whatever the uh, horrible history that happened, it did create a new world for us. And it's almost like an outcropping of the homogeneous scene where the whole world was linked through plants and species for the first time. And now this is happening digitally. And so this is a point where digitally it can, you know, it can be taken advantage of for those who learn. And so the, uh, you know, where I come in, in my view of it is that I want to try to empower as many people as I can to learn about this and to be able to leverage it. Cool. Thank you, Carlos. So um, I, I kept forgetting to say, so then there will be a mad rush that, um, uh, well, we don't have the chat turned on, so you can't reply to any of the things I'm putting in it. Um, we do have a Q&A, um, and so I encourage anybody who has questions for any of the panelists um, to uh, throw it in there, and I'll, I, uh, I will pick and choose it in a completely centralized uh, fashion. Um, but maybe we can undermine this with some Web 3.0 separate Q&A session that's going on out there somewhere um, with actual cash prizes. So, um, but I have one question, again, moderator's privilege. I think we, we there was an interesting contrast, right, where, where Andrew and Kevin were like, well, you know, I think we got it right. And then uh, Clev, Clev and Carlos were talking about, well, actually, the current internet sucks. Um, so I have a I have a, a question about this, which is sort of if we see the current internet as um, as I said the the incumbents now, is what's going to happen now that Web three point is going to replace or bring down those incumbents, and does it have an opportunity to fix the problems that we've seen? Uh, and I guess for the bonus point, what is what are those? What do you see as those those problems in particular? Clev, I, I, you you first raised this, and maybe I overstated when you said I said it. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. You're absolutely correct. The internet is broken. It does not suck because we use it so much, right? We've come become so dependent of it. The problem is the internet was supposed to decentralize us, right? It was supposed to be this decentralized platform for the world but it ended up to be a, a, a centralized space that's controlled by a handful of people. That is not decentralization. So at some point, you know, we went the wrong way, right? Data sharing was important, but data mining and selling people's data was not where we should be. So, so I do think it's how the internet has been used, how it's been the architecture of it. And I do think this conversation now about Web3 and the capacity to leverage artificial intelligence to inject decentralized tools like smart contracts, you know, like DeFi 
is revolutionary and can actually you know, close some of those fault lines, address some of those gaps, but also put us back on track. So, so, so I would say we're not trying to eliminate the current internet and start all over. I think it is how can we you know, address some of the issues, but certainly leverage new technologies and then create a more secure place where trust is restored. Kevin, I, I, so Cliff pointed out this thing of the, the, the part of the selling point of the original internet that it wasn't an AOL, it wasn't one of these proprietary networks, and it was going to decentralize power. What do you think went wrong? And, and do you think it's the role of regulators or technologists to kind of fix that? Well, first of all, a lot went wrong, but it's important, and, and Clev alluded to this, not, not to make it seem as though nothing happened because of the internet and, and we're all somehow enslaved to, to our new lords and masters. There, there's tremendous empowerment of billions of people all around the world because of the internet, even in an environment where we, we see very prominently the downsides of the big dominant platforms and the way markets have consolidated. Um, so, I mean, I, I tend to think that it's really easy to reduce these things to very simple good and evil, um, you know, one thing disrupts the other or not, when really it's a lot more complicated. Uh, it's typically not the case that the, the new services directly frontally confront and replace the old ones. So, so the internet has transformed media, but you look at the massive media companies that are out there today, many of them are companies that were around before. It's totally transformed financial services, but you look at Wall Street and many of the big players are still there. Uh, and much of what happened, it's, it's not that Google came along and um, did exactly what Microsoft was doing before and outcompeted Microsoft. Guess what? Microsoft is still around as an internet company. Um, the new companies generally tend to, if they're going to be really successful, do something different. There are these edge cases. There are cases like the voice over IP service where it's providing telephony in direct competition. But, but most of the time what we see is, is really an evolution of the market. So the new providers and the new communities have a challenge. They need to get to scale. Um, and there are strong network effects, which just inherently lead to consolidation and centralization at some level, even when the underlying technology is, is fundamentally decentralized at some level. So, so I think it's, it's a mistake to think about this as um, you know, everything now is totally centralized and everything tomorrow with Web3 is going to be totally decentralized. It's a matter of understanding what's the value that gets created, um, to whom. And in that process, regulators absolutely have a role. Um, regulators, I think where they went wrong, and, and Andrew, I expect would agree with me, was when the big tech platforms started becoming significant, not realizing what had changed. Be because all of these Silicon Valley companies, these were the entrants. These were the new guys coming in, going against the big incumbents. Um, and there was a point where there was a, necess a necessity for policymakers to realize, well, no, these guys have become big now. Um, and they have, should have certain kinds of obligations to not stamp out newer innovations that, that come after. Um, and so we need to have that constant dialogue. Uh, and we also need to understand you know, which services are in regulated areas. So, so one interesting thing about a lot of this blockchain and cryptocurrency based innovation is it's in finance um, in a way that the early internet services in the 90s weren't. Finance is a regulated industry um, and for good reason. We, we don't want people to have completely unconstrained ability to get scammed by anyone because we know time and time again, that's what will happen. Um, but we need to think about um, when those regulations had the unintended consequences um, of uh, entrenching the incumbents and raising the cost, as, as Carlos was saying, preventing, for example, people from having access to the banking system. Absolutely, regulators in some cases are the cause of the problem, but they really have to have a role as well uh, in solving those problems. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that, that um, you know, with the proposals that we see, I see right now, I think that they definitely take this sort of consumer rights model, right? That the, the, the interest I think of most lawmakers is in protecting people, as you say, from, from scams or, or losing more money than they can, they can accept. Um, Andrew, in the old internet, I think that there was a lot more discussion about you know, how do we democratically manage this at the global level? And Wolfgang Klein, I'm going to murder this name. Kleinvector. Wolfgang Kleinvector. 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 Um, Ganz genau. 
mentioned something that was a bit of a, 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 a catchphrase in, in, in the early internet, which is multi-stakeholder approach, right? Where we have government, uh, tech companies, and, uh, and nonprofits or the users themselves working together to work with policies. Do you think that's something that will, particularly in a, a world where um, you know, a lot of blockchain people, a lot of Web 3.0 people are organizing around these decentralized DAOs, right? A different form of organizing. Do you think that 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 still holds promise in this new period? Well, I mean, I, I'd answer I, I answer it this way. I think that the to me the most exciting thing about blockchains and distributed technologies is this vast uh, kind of uh, ocean of experiments and governance that we see taking place right now. I could not be more fascinated um, by the rise of things like distributed autonomous organizations and other efforts to self-govern technologies, to self-govern resources. Um, I think that's amazing. Whether the old multi-stakeholder model you know, was kind of like a success or a failure depends on what test you set up for it. So you know, by the test that we set out uh, initially, which is that the domain name system should be reliable and it has really been reliable, that it should be um, global and preserve global interconnectivity, it has done that and that it should be basically low cost to the user. And it is basically done that. Anybody can get a domain name for six bucks a year or something like that. So anyway, like in, by one measure, that's been a wild success. On the other hand, and I, I say this as a, as a you know, loving alumnus of the organization, but when I look at ICANN right now, I think it is highly susceptible to the critique that it is captured by economically interested actors that flood the, multi, the open multi-stakeholder zone with participants that take advantage of open process. And I don't think the, that ICANN has gone off the rails at all. I think it's operated within you know, a good set of like norms and bounds, but its decisions have made a lot of money for a small number of people that went into the process with a lot of money. And so to me, that's not like a great, you know, I wouldn't give that like an A, uh, that was you know, some like worse grade than that. I mean, so, so, so I think one of the things that's super exciting is to see how focused participant oriented governance can emerge and can basically be baked into uh, new products, new services, new infrastructures. I'm very much in love with that. I think that's uh, one of the cool things happening right now. Ev, what 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 drew you into into the crypto space, and what do you who do you think is being unrepresented in this conversation and the conversation in DC right now? Who did Kev freeze? Oh no. Oh no, we it lost happened, happened to be It happened to be earlier, as long as we're uh, uh, talking yeah. about uh, freezing up. I, I got bounced and then I had to come back back on. So oh, no. it all happened to her. It also, it also happened to me as well before, but I'm back. This is because <laughs> we're dependent on web 2.0 and they know what we're talking about. Okay, well, I'll turn to Day, some Day, of can these. I just can, can I maybe just yeah. vamp on one quick point and then we'll see if yeah, Clev gets back on. So here, the one, one thing which is like, okay, so what, what's like a real lesson to learn from from the past, I think there's just one one that maybe is worth calling out here, which is this, which is that with any new set of infrastructures, not just the participants, the providers of the services, the builders of the infrastructure, but also regulators uh, on behalf of the public interest, legislators and regulatory agencies. One of the things that you absolutely have to do is plan for abuse, plan for misuse, plan for uh, the terrible things that people are gonna do. I, I spent about a year working at Tumblr. Tumblr was a free hosting platform for images and videos. And guess what? It had a colossal amount of porn, including illegal uh, child sex abuse imagery that would show up on the platform. And uh, you know, the, the company at the time I was there was like learning how to deal with it, learning how to automate tools, learning how to automate detection, learning how to deal with it. When I was at Google, we launched a social network called Orkut that got wildly popular in Brazil and India. And Google was way behind the curve when it came to provisioning uh, support to be able to even just read and respond to user generated reports about abusive behavior. And a lot of terrible stuff was taking place on the platform and Google had to like figure out how to like get ahead and provision. So a thing that, that is smart for everybody to do when you're building a decentralized technology is think through, doesn't mean that you have to like follow one particular solution, but think through how are people potentially going to abuse it if they can and it's cheap and it's possible they will. 
And so you just have to think that through and you've got to know how you're going to respond to it. And in some cases, particularly around financial services, the imperative of consumer protection requires that regulators get involved in order to fulfill their mandate to protect the public interest. What form that takes is another question, but leaving, you know, kind of like regulators off the arena, just on the hope that people aren't going to use new technologies for obviously, you know, uh, capable misuses is, is a mistake. Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. And, and actually, I'll, I'll throw in a really good link. This is by one of the um, FFDW funds um, explorations of the decentralized web for the public good. And a great project that we fund is the Starling Lab, um, which uh, preserves uh, Holocaust testimony um, from the Shoah Foundation, but actually multiple genocides um, uh, before and after from live victims uh, in a protective decentralized way. And they uh, asked Rebecca McKinnon to talk a little about what less, what, what, what the Web 2.0 got wrong and what the um, Web 3.0 should be thinking about. Clev, I'm so glad you're back. Um, we have a hard stop, I've been told, at, um, at four. Um, but I'd like to give you the last word because I was just about to ask you when you got thrown off. Um, but my question is like, from your experience actually in the crypto community, you know, one of the hardest things we had in Web 1.0 is getting the people who knew about the technology and were affected by it into the Washington conversation. Have, who do you think is not being represented in DC right now? And hey, in the, in the questions and answers that we've had now. Yes, I, I do think obviously representation is very important. Clearly, you know, we have a lot to, to do in terms of in the crypto space, in terms of diversity and inclusion. But I do think that, you know, regulators have a role to play and they have to make sure they're speaking to all stakeholders. The, the crypto community is much more diverse than people think. I know you put in the chat the Time Magazine article that talked about, you know, Black and Latinx innovators. You know, it, it's pretty diverse. But one of the challenges I would put to 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 legislators, Washington regulators, is is to actually look at you know how they're looking at consumer protections and make sure that they're not using it as a tool to keep innovators of color out because too much prote protectionism can be a challenge. And then the last thing I would say, I know we have to close, is the fact that we have to close the digital divide. Government can actually take it, take that into consideration, and in the crypto community, as we build, we have to think about that as well. Because it doesn't matter if it's Web One, Web Two, or Web Three. If we don't close the digital divide, many people will still be left out, and that would be a failure if we keep moving forward, not understanding that accessibility is a big problem. Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, there's so much to talk about. Thank you so much to all our guests um, for just really opening this discussion. I remember the, the very beginnings of Web 1.0, the biggest job was to just sort of understand, there was a very short transition for between the people who were the explorers really understanding this and then desperately running back to explain this to the people who's, who had the responsibility of, of guiding these new technologies for the benefit of, of everyone. So again, thank you to all our guests. Um, thank you to the uh, Internet um, Caucus Academy for um, uh, 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 allowing us to have this time. If you have any questions, um, uh, you can find us all on LinkedIn and ask us. Um, and, uh, and I believe there are a number of events happening right now um, around the Filecoin Foundation, Filecoin's uh, annual uh, 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 anniversary. So I think we're doing more in DC and uh, I think we'll see much more discussion about this. So thank you again, Andrew, Kevin, Carlos. Um, thank you, Danny. Uh, Clev, thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.